Um, I'm Emily, and in today's talk, we're going to talk about bias and unconscious bias, and how it affects folks like us in tech workspaces, and what we can do about it. Great. Um, so just a little bit more about me. Um, my pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'm a PhD candidate at UC Berkeley. Um, I'm studying chocolate and how humans can save it, so I know very important work. Um, but while my work doesn't have me playing around in JavaScript all that much, I do do a lot of data science in R and Python. But today, my day job doesn't matter. Um, instead, we're going to talk about something that affects everyone in this room, because we are all humans, and that's unconscious bias. So who here has gone to some sort of diversity training that they felt was a big waste of time? Yeah, I definitely have. Um, and as it turns out, studies have shown that a bad training can actually have a negative effect on people, so they can come out of an, a bad training with more hostile attitudes towards people who are different from them. And so at the Unconscious Bias Project, um, where most of us are either in grad school or have PhDs in STEM fields, we've always been really careful to only promote evidence-based approaches. We also want the information we provide to empower you, um, instead of leaving you even more deflated about the current state of the world. And that's why our motto is 100%, oops, yeah. 100% empowerment, 0% guilt trip. And today I'm going to teach you all tools to reduce the effect of unconscious bias. And I want you to leave this conference um, as unconscious bias warriors or ambassadors that are dedicated to making a positive impact in your circle so that tech becomes more and more diverse, inclusive, and equitable. So I'll be going over a lot of tools and resources today in my talk. But don't worry, if you miss something, um, you'll be able to access all of the peer-reviewed literature and all of the other resources I mentioned um, on our website. So finally, before we jump into the good stuff, I want to mention that I'll be touching on issues that are deeply personal. And some of the examples that I may present could be triggering to some of you in the audience. But I present them in the hopes of having a frank conversation about why they are harmful and what, we can what steps we can take as individuals and bystanders um, to make the world a better place. So unfortunately, I won't really have any time for questions from the audience up here on stage, but I encourage you to come find me if you have questions, concerns, or comments about the presentation. And so with that, let's start with a definition. So we need to be on the same page about what bias is. And bias is prejudice in favor of or against one group, person, or thing compared with another in usually a way considered to be unfair. So unconscious or implicit bias is bias that you have even though you don't consciously agree with it or even know that it's there. And most people don't want to be racist or sexist, but a lot of us are unconsciously biased against certain groups anyway. And this starts with negative stereotypes from the world around us. What we see in TV shows and movies, um, hear on the radio, read in books, see on the internet, and even pick up from our friends and family. And so even if we don't unconsciously agree with these negative stereotypes, they can still worm their way into our unconscious and influence how we think and act. So I'd like to call attention to a few examples of negative stereotypes from American culture to show you what I'm talking about. Men are seen as breadwinners and women as caregivers. Women can be beautiful or intelligent, but not both. African Americans are commonly portrayed as loud and bias can even come from simple associations of patterns that we notice unconsciously, like that custodians are often racial minorities. And before stereotypes even lead to bias, stereotypes themselves are damaging. Being stereotyped has been found to lead to short-term aggression, inability to focus, which results in decreased performance, and overeating. People who regularly encounter the threat um, of being judged by a negative stereotype are more likely to have hypertension, be depressed, and to rate their own health more poorly. And being on the receiving end of positive bias or positive stereotypes hurts too. Implying someone is good at math because they are Asian might make the receiver of the comment dislike the speaker and invoke feelings of anger. But when stereotypes lead to unconscious bias about who can thrive in science and tech, this can, be even, this can have even more damaging effects um, by creating barriers to entering STEM fields. And this is the so-called pipeline problem. And folks start being affected by this bias at a very early age, and it happens around the world. So this paper is actually from Germany, and I'll be presenting a few more papers in, the, in this section. 
Um, here the researchers showed that teachers have both conscious and unconscious stereotypes about boys being better at math and girls being better at languages. And those stereotypes influence whether the teachers recommend boys and girls for science and technology schools versus language-oriented schools. And this bias continues from grade school through graduate school. But the pipeline is only the beginning of the problem. Um, once marginalized people get their foot in the door, unconscious bias leads to barriers to rising in STEM. So study after study has found evidence of bias against almost any marginalized group you can think of in terms of who gets called back for an interview. And as we all know, jobs are pretty important. Um, and this type of bias occurs even when that discrimination is illegal in that area. So in the United States, there's bias against openly gay men and bias against people with disabilities, even when the disability would not have affected the person's ability to perform the job. Um, in the United States and China, being a parent hurt job prospects for women, but it was actually the opposite for men. Being a father helped job prospects. And one last example, bias was found against people with Arabic sounding names among both, among both American and Dutch reviewers. So imagine experiencing these biases every time you apply to a job or when you want to move up within your own company or switch to a different team. Um, and imagine how much harder that might be or how much worse that bias might be if you're an Arabic lesbian mother in a wheelchair. And studies have actually looked specifically at this type of intersection, um, for instance, between gender and race. So women and racial minorities are both less likely to be given the benefit of the doubt. And the problem is only worse if you're both a woman and a racial minority. So when women of color demonstrate leadership and competence, their assertiveness is perceived negatively and the data shows that they get pushback for it. So even when you're successful, unsupportive work environments are a common reason for leaving STEM. In the next few slides, I'll be focusing on women, um, but these trends are representative of most underrepresented groups in tech. So let me be frank, women do leave STEM at greater rates than they leave the non-STEM workforce. The orange line that you see on the screen is women being retained in non-STEM fields. Now let's look at STEM. As you can see, the retention is much, much worse. And less than 20% of the women who leave STEM fields are also leaving the workforce. For instance, like taking care of family. Um, more than 80% of the women leaving the STEM workforce are just getting jobs in other fields. They're going to non-STEM fields. Um, so let's look at a different control and focus in on just the tech industry. When you compare the attrition rates of, um, of women to men in tech, it's more than twice as high. 41% of women leave tech versus just 17% of men. And on top of the well-documented pay gap that exists, there are many cultural cues that a company can give to signal that an employee is not valued, which in turn encourages that employee to leave. One is feedback and performance reviews. In this study, the majority of women received reviews with negative, unhelpful feedback, while the majority of men received only constructive feedback. And the negative feedback for women was about personality in ways that reflect common unconscious biases like telling women to pipe down or be less abrasive. So together, these barriers keep some groups underrepresented in STEM and tech and reinforce pre-existing stereotypes, creating what we've dubbed the positive feedback loop of negative stereotypes. And there is so, so much more peer-reviewed literature out there that shows that unconscious bias is real and it is impacting diversity. Um, if you'd like to explore more, um, please head over to our website where you can find all of the papers that I mentioned in this talk, as well as hundreds others um, about almost every aspect of bias, its effect, and what we can do about it. Okay, so let's take a breath, because that was a lot of bad news. And I know some of you might be feeling a little low at this point in the talk. But the good news is that we're only about halfway through, and that means we have a lot of time to talk about solutions. So even though stereotypes come from our environment, that doesn't make us powerless. Happily, there's enough studies out there that we know how to reduce negative effects of bias and reliably reduce our biases too. So thoughts are actually our first line of defense when confronting bias. So I'm gonna teach you two techniques that can help you decrease your own unconscious bias. Um, but before we start training, we need to cover some prerequisites. In order for these techniques to be effective for you, you need to be motivated to overcome your unconscious bias. Hopefully the positive loop of negative stereotypes helps to give you that motivation. 
you then need to take steps to become aware of your bias and why it exists. And we'll explore how to recognize your own bias in the first technique that I teach you, um, but you can also do it through more technical ways by taking an implicit association test at Harvard's Project Implicit website. Um, you'll need to learn the, to detect the subtle influence of bias in your everyday surroundings, which helps you know when to act. And then you have to practice these strategies um, to reduce your bias so that you, you know what to do in that moment when you recognize it. And yes, you do have to practice. Without practice, there will be no change. Okay, so let's learn our first strategy. I want you to take a look at this picture and think to yourself, what is your first reaction to it? If I asked you to describe who these people are and what they were doing, what would you think? What would you say? Did you assume that each of these people are engineers or designers, beginners or experienced, straight or queer, disabled or not, communicating well or poorly? When I first saw this picture, I thought young, inexperienced interns, and that's my bias. So once you've acknowledged that your own biases are informing the way you see people, you can choose to replace any biased aspect of your thoughts or your reaction with a different, less stereotypical um, scenario. And this is what we call breaking down the stereotype. The idea here is to consciously recognize that a thought that you had came from a stereotype, and instead of leaving that bias buried in your subconscious, bring it to the surface and then replace it. So in this case, I can choose to recognize my biased reaction and think CEOs, entrepreneurs, leaders, experienced. Okay, so let's move on to our second strategy, which is increasing opportunities for contact. And it is probably one of the most important strategies that you'll find, um, because it tends to help with all aspects of breaking down our biases. It can make us confront our basic assumptions, it helps us empathize with individuals who are different from us, and it can give us non-stereotypic examples that we can continuously use to fight our own bias. And there's many ways to do this, even if you aren't a social butterfly. So you can try going to a diverse conference like this one. Um, you could follow folks like the other amazing speakers that you've heard on Twitter. Um, you can contribute to an open source project with diverse maintainers, or you could mentor someone new or find a mentor for yourself. Whatever feels like a good step for you, that's enough. And I'm not gonna lie, increasing opportunities for contact can be scary sometimes too. So if you struggle with this, like I tend to do, it's always a good move to listen and be genuinely curious. Twitter and blogs can be an awesome start because you can follow along and get a sense of what someone might or might not wanna talk about. It also helps to be open to hearing things you didn't expect, reading body language cues, and believing what people say about their experiences, even if it seems contradictory to, what, to something that you thought you knew. And if someone gives you some hard feedback or just doesn't have time to talk, try and stay humble. Other people are the main character in their, their own story. So as a group, let's set an intention to use the rest of this conference to meet new people and help increase our opportunities for contact with groups that are underrepresented in our workplaces. And let's try and maintain those connections after this conference, even if it is just following a new person on Twitter. So to wrap up this section, unconsciously biased thoughts are a habit, and like any habit, they can be broken, mostly. Um, you can never be quite cured of unconscious bias, but over time, the strategies to reduce bias become habits themselves, and it will feel easier to quash unconscious bias when it comes up again. So let's shift away from our internal struggles and dive into how we can respond to bias in our environments. We've been working with an amazing cartoonist, Teresa Oborn, to illustrate real scenarios that come up and how we can react when they do. So we have cartoons showing bias against white women, people of color, bias against people with disabilities, against queer folks, and so on. Um, but for this talk, I picked just a couple of cartoons that I hope are less emotionally charged than others, um, but still useful for practicing these techniques. So who's heard this one before? She's really smart, but I wish she wasn't so bossy. So I have, and I may have thought it one or two times too. Remember that we are all biased and we can even be biased against our own group. Um, so let's identify this bias. This cartoon showcases a common bias against women in leadership roles. So what are your options when someone says this to you? Instead of labeling the person who made the comment as racist or sexist, inciting reflection on the comment through four simple strategies will help to highlight the problematic nature of it and reflect and <laughs> encourage a change in behavior rather than an argument. So our first strategy is just to observe the problem. 
Instead of saying, staying silent or moving on, observe that the comment was stereotypical and hurtful. Something like, ouch, that's a bit harsh. Or you could counter a microaggression with a microaffection. She's not bossy, she's a leader. A positive comment like this can help weaken the negative stereotype for those around you and without being too confrontational or derailing the conversation. Our bystander could also reflect the comment back, um, which would make the speaker do the work of challenging their own assumptions. Something like, how come you never call guys bossy? Um, and finally, he could simply label the stereotype that's in play. Hmm, I think that's reinforcing a hurtful gender stereotype. Or as a friend said to me when I was practicing this talk a few days ago, bias much, bro? Okay, so let's practice. In this cartoon, a manager is just finishing up a meeting and asking one of his newer team members, does your wife take care, take care of the kids or do you do daycare? Sorry, let me repeat that. Does your wife take care of the kids or do you do daycare? Um, as an opportunity to meet people right now, um, I would like you to form groups of two or three, make sure no one is left out, um, and identify the stereotype or types in this cartoon, and then brainstorm a few responses of your own. Um, I'll give you a little bit more than a minute to do that, and I'm actually going to ask um, Visnu to come up and play some lilting ukulele tunes to keep you calm um, <laughs> while you are brainstorming <laughs> and talking. Um, so when you hear his music stop, uh, please turn your attention back up on stage to me. talking and I'm so glad that all of you have so much to say about this. So um, let's review uh, what we just, what hopefully you just went over and had great ideas about. So um, there are actually two biases in this situation and I hope some of you picked up on that. So the first is that dads don't play an active role in parenting and the second is that dads must be in a heterosexual relationship. Yeah, right? <laughs> I, I couldn't, oh, monogamy, yeah, you know? Could be in a polyamorous relationship too. Okay, so let's review some of the possible responses that our dad could use in this situation. The team member could observe the problem by saying, actually, my husband and I share parenting responsibilities equally. He could also use positive redirection. I take pride in being the primary caretaker of my children. Um, he could also transfer the work. Why are those the only options? Um, and finally, he could label the stereotype. As a gay father who manages our family's childcare, my situation is only unusual for those who hold unfair gender biases. <laughs> so that one might be a little wordy, but I'm sure you can come up with some that 
you would use in that situation too. Um, so we want all of you to feel represented by our cartoons. So feel free to share your own real experiences of bias um, with us through our website, and maybe they will be made into a cartoon to teach others to be more empathetic humans. And um, to Born the Great is actually the cartoonist's um, Instagram and Twitter uh, handle. So if you want to tweet at her, feel free. So in parallel with personal adjustments that you can make to your words and thoughts, there's also important work that can be done at an organizational level through putting good policies in place. Now, I bet some of you might be resisting this idea a bit. Um, after all, tech is a meritocracy, right? Well, no, exactly the opposite. <laughs> the fact that the tech sector celebrates the idea of innate talent is actually evidence that tech is not a meritocracy. This study shows that when you focus on just coding or engineering, um, instead of including holistic values like teamwork, transparency, and consistency in performance reviews, then manager level folks with unconscious bias are more likely to review their team members with that bias, regardless of how awesome a person's code is. So you can think of good policies as the, as the bumpers in bowling. Without them, people with more unconscious bias will throw more gutter balls um, by unintentionally acting with their biases. On the other hand, good policies can guide people's behavior in the direction that you want it to go if you consciously ask them towards an environment that includes and recognizes everyone's unique talent. So many conversations about policies usually start with hiring, how to get more diverse candidates into the recruiting pipeline, how to get more through the interview process, and how to have more, have more of them accept offers. And hiring really is an important place to start, but it's only one small piece of the puzzle. So once you have employees on staff, there's a wide range of, um, of ways you can provide inclusive support that meet the different needs and working styles of different people um, might have. And when people on your team get into the habit of valuing each other as unique individuals, that internal culture can actually translate into building more equitable, less biased products for your users. So we like to say that policy should come from overarching principles. And one of the most important is aiming for inclusion and equity, not just diversity. We haven't really defined those terms yet, so here's how I think about it. I think of diversity as about being about headcount and representation. As an example, do you do user research with people with disabilities? Equity is about resources and opportunity. Do you compensate people with disabilities at a fair and just level considering their unique perspective, their investment in giving you that feedback, and the extra value that they're adding to your product? And inclusion is the hardest to measure. It's about how marginalized people feel about your culture. Do people with disabilities come away feeling like valued partners? Um, do you create an environment where they can provide honest feedback, and do you listen and act on their feedback? So let's give you some examples. To improve inclusion and equity within your um, organization, you can work at many levels. So you could write more inclusive job descriptions. A cool, to, cool, a cool tool here is Textio, which I think one of our previous speakers actually works at right now, um, which points out masculine and feminine wordings and helps you shift the balance in your job description so that everyone feels comfortable applying. You could also expand benefits beyond just young single employees. One example is allowing flexible hours for child or elder care, um, or you could make, make remote work an option for everyone. Um, you should also account for power dynamics during conflict resolution. This can relieve some pressure from marginalized people who may feel trapped or powerless if there's a dispute. So focusing on diversity without also working on inclusion and equity can create a situation where you get diverse people in the door um, to get your metrics up, but they encounter high levels of unconscious bias on their team, and they'll be quicker to leave. If you make inclusion, equity, and bias reduction priorities too, marginalized people may be more likely to stay on your team and recruit others to join. And with that, let's wrap up. So yes, unconscious bias is a real problem. And yes, ways to reduce unconscious bias are real too. And no matter what role we play in different situations or different organizations, we each have options for what to say in the moment when we see or experience bias and what policies we can advocate for that can guide everyone towards less bias. And even though most of us here have unconscious bias, those biases don't own us. Um, with dedication, we can practice breaking that bias habit and becoming closer to the people around us and closer to the people that we want to be. So if you'd like more info, please come talk to me or contact us online or go to our website. Um, 
UBP is always super excited to speak to new people and new organizations about what they can do to improve their culture and decrease the effective bias in their workplaces. We are a volunteer-driven nonprofit, so if you'd like to get involved, um, you can visit our website or chat with me again. Um, and you can also just jump right in by joining our weekly virtual meetings using the Join UBP link. So thank you so much, and let's work together to weed out unconscious bias in all of our workplaces.